Okay, everyone. Today we're going to talk about equine influenza. So influenza in the horse is the type A, the one that afflicts the horses. In humans, we have A, B, and C, with B and C being less severe than the type A. Type A is the more uh, severe type of influenza. It is an enveloped virus, which means that uh, this virus has a lipid envelope around it, which uh, means that because it's a lipid envelope, it can be easily um, killed with regular washing the hands and soap because anything that will uh, denature fat, uh, which is soap would be, you know, dish soap, detergent, anything like that, acetone, alcohol, anything will um, kill this virus. Um, embedded on this envelope, there is going to be about 500 spikes uh, of which are proteins. And these spikes are going to be the hemagglutinin and neuronimidase, uh, which is the H and the N giving the virus uh, the HN, you know, H1N1, uh, in humans H3N2, and they are what gives, you know, the virus um, that nomenclature. The hemagglutinin is the viral receptor binding. It is responsible for this virus finding the cell that it has affinity for, which is, for example, in, in the case of influenza, the respiratory epithelium, and it binds to that cell. And uh, in the case of influenza, the hemagglutinin is the target for uh, the host immune response. So just so you guys can see, this is um, the influenza virus. Uh, it looks like, you know, I guess if we've been looking at the COVID virus, it looks semi-similar. Uh, it has the spikes, it's enveloped, it has loose RNA inside, uh, and it has, um, you know, this lipid envelope around. The neuronimidase protein is what is going to assist the virus into budding out of the cell. So here, let me just draw this. So here we have a host cell and a virus, and then the uh, hemagglutinin is what allows this virus to bind to the cell. And then as it binds, it injects its uh, RNA material inside the cell, and then it starts to replicate, 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 replicate. And then it's the neuronimidase that allows this virus to bind to the cell back again to then bud out of the cell with the virus and the lipid uh, envelope around it. Uh, there's going to be 16 uh, subtypes of hemagglutinin and nine subtypes of neuronimidase. So you can have H1N1, H1N2, H1N3. You can have all sorts of combinations uh, with the subtypes and that's how there is so much variation between um, influenza viruses. Uh, all the uh, HNM, NN have been acquired from aquatic birds. Uh, and they provide, these aquatic birds are going to provide a global reservoir for the influenza virus of all subtypes. Horses generally uh, are going to be affected with H7N7 and H3N8. Uh, now in horses, the influenza viruses has mutated some, but it's not as highly mutated as it is in humans, okay? Um, the H7N7 doesn't, uh, it hasn't been seen much in horses anymore, although it's still included in most vaccinations um, for the horses, but um, you know, even though it hasn't been seen much. The H3N8 was first isolated in the US in 1963, and it circulates around the world except a few countries. So Iceland, is uh, negative for influenza, Australia and New Zealand. Now in Australia, there was an influenza outbreak in 2007, where a horse, a stud horse from Japan came uh, to Australia and he was febrile, but he was missed and he was put into that, um, to that place in Sydney where they had um, 
the the Olympics and he was put there and then from there it spread to the entire country and the entire country had to put a stop to racing uh, to any competition to everything because they were uh, free and uh, of influenza and now all these horses are sick 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 and as we're going to learn here when horses get influenza they get really sick uh, and specifically those horses there because they because the country was is considered and it's back to being considered negative uh, the horses there are not vaccinated. So when you don't have any herd immunity, there is no immunity whatsoever for this resident horse. And then every time that you have zero immunity for any disease, and this is the first time that the disease affects uh, or arrives at a place, the severity of the disease is much, much higher, okay? Uh, they have been able to eliminate the disease again. And, uh, but that's it. billions of dollars were spent uh, in Australia because of that. Um, since the 80s, the H3 and 8 has diverged into two distinct lineages. There's still the H3 and 8, but we have the American and the European lineage. And like I said, it doesn't mutate as much as the humans. Uh, the highest, the epidemiology of this disease, the highest incidence for this disease is um, the horse that are two and three years of age. And the reason for that, can old horses get influenza? They sure can. But the reason for the highest incidence being in younger horses is because that's the age where horses are removed from, say, being out at pasture, and that's when they start um, their training life, okay? So their life changes uh, substantially by the age of two. They start uh, being trained. They are put inside uh, stables. Their level of stress increases exponentially. Uh, they are worked, they are stressed, they are exercised. They are put in close proximity under the same roof with multiple other horses. And training facilities, horses that come from different uh, uh, areas and different uh, management systems. So that is why it becomes a problem. And that's generally when we have outbreaks of influenza, although, it can affect older horses as well. Um, so the outbreaks are caused by the commingling of susceptible animals in racetracks, horse shows, sales, airplanes, etc., under the same roof, okay? It has a very short incubation period. Infected animals are going to um, develop fever. They're going to start shedding large quantities of the virus within 24 to 48 hours. So you get one horse sick, so that one horse arrives at the facility, he is sick and he's shedding the virus within one day to two days. Many horses that have been in contact with that horse will start shedding, uh, it will start getting sick as well. Uh, because there is going to be a huge devastation to the respiratory tract, uh, there is going to be very, uh, it, it's semi common to have a secondary bacterial infection uh, that is going to cause pneumonia in these horses. Morbidity is about 60 to 90%. So morbidity is the number of horses that got in contact with the disease, the ones that developed the disease, okay? So 100 horses got in contact with the virus, between 60 to 90 will become sick. So that's what morbidity. So it's a very, very high morbidity rate. Mortality rate is only 1%, so very low mortality rate. <clears throat> and mortality rate is of the horses that got sick, the ones that died. And that's the mortality rate is very low, but it's still a very, very devastating disease because it's extremely expensive. This horse has to be out of work for a long period of time. Uh, so the rule of thumb is to have um, the horse rest for one week for every day that the horse has a fever. So if this horse has fever for two, three days, um, this horse needs to rest for three weeks. And then, only then, and it takes three weeks for the epithelium to start to regenerate anyway, to be close to normal. But even then, if anybody has had influenza and had the full course of the disease, you feel like death for about a week. Uh, this is if you haven't, um, you know, been to the doctor to receive like Tamiflu. So you, you, pretty much get really, really severely sick. And then even after uh, you don't shed the virus anymore, you're not sick anymore, you don't have fever anymore, you still have difficulty going up a flight of stairs, you have your, your fitness level decreases substantially, and it, takes, it, it may take a month or two for your lungs to stop burning 
when uh, you go up a flight of stairs or you go for a long walk, okay? After natural infection, these horses are immune, may become immune to this disease for, you know, a little bit over six months with the immunity declining thereafter. So this is a disease that doesn't have a long-term immunity, okay? Vaccination is not going to come for full protection. Uh, and so even when the horses are vaccinated, they may still get influenza. What happens is that they may get a more mild form of the disease, okay? Or so they may not be super, super sick with fevers of 105, 106. They may be, you know, febrile for with 103 of fever as opposed to super, super high. However, vaccination of populations of horses will be better because then it, it, it's a way to almost like uh, limit the spread of the disease because you're gonna have herd immunity. So not everybody gets devastatedly sick. Uh, so that's what is important uh, to vaccinate horses that are gonna be commingling. So show horses, race horses, in training facilities, et cetera. The spread is going to be, the transmission of the disease is going to be direct contact. So nose to nose contact with a sick horse or even droplets and airborne, uh, maybe fomites. So fomites are inanimate objects such as halters, lead ropes, buckets. Um, but no studies have confirmed uh, that fomites actually do pass the disease, but it's assumed that it does. But because it's a, uh, an encapsulated virus and you can easily kill, you know, maybe it dies in surfaces such as in fomites. But it's most likely it does pass the disease. Um, horses that have influenza, their cough is so strong that when they cough, ah, they uh, spread the virus in droplets and airborne for many, many feet. Uh, so even horses that are across the stall, uh, from that horse, uh, if this horse coughs violently, he can spread the disease that way. After infection, the horse is going to shed the virus for, for seven days. Uh, so even if he only gets fe has fever for two, three days, he will be shedding the virus for uh, seven days. And uh, horses with subclinical infection, so subclinical means that um, the horse is sick, is shedding the virus, but is not showing clinical signs. Uh, which in this case is most likely vaccinated horses, can shed the virus and uh, infect susceptible horses. Uh, what is the target? What is the pathogenesis of this disease? Uh, so this virus is going to target the epithelial cells of the airway, and it is going to go, you know, enter the nose and then go to the trachea, and it's going to have to pass through the mucus layer that we have, you know, involving the respiratory system to gain access to the epithelial cell. And that's why it's important to have a well-working mucociliated system to try to prevent, you know, the day-to-day -day, um, disease such as like influenza. But influenza virus is a virus that's very uh, virulent. It causes um, a lot of disease. Uh, the virus is going to spread really, really quickly throughout the respiratory tract, and it will damage the epithelial cells a lot. It will cause what we call denudation, which is destroy the epithelial uh, surface, uh, which is what I say here. Virus replication is going to lead to cell death, desquamation, and denudation. Desquamation, they're going to like be removed, and there's going to be denudation, like nude, okay? Uh, What's going to happen is now the, the tracheal mucociliary system is going to be totally impaired. Those cells are not going to be there anymore. And that is going to predispose these infected animals to secondary bacterial infections. Uncomplicated cases, cases where the horse has a more mild disease, the resolution uh, of epithelial damage is going to take a minimum of three weeks. It takes three weeks for these epithelial cells to regenerate themselves. Now, a horse that has a high fever or may have a little bit of bacterial infection is going to take longer than three weeks to be able to start getting back to normal again. So like I said, it's one week of rest per day of fever. So if this horse has had multiple days of fever, that's how many days of rest he can get. And then you have to start working these horses. Uh, it may be three months before these horses can start to work again and it's gonna be another two, three months before that horse is up to that training level that he was when, before he got sick. 
So this photo here is going to show uh, what the epithelial lining looks like. It looks like a cauliflower um, because these are all, you know, this is, uh, this is with uh, electronic microscopy, but this is the cilia of those little cells, as you can see, and this is what we see here. Uh, this is after influenza attacks. It looks like a desert, so it's desolated land. The epithelial layer has just been totally removed. Uh, you can see um, the little cells, you know, the little cilia simply don't even exist. And here is three weeks later with little cells trying to regenerate themselves, okay? So it takes a long time for uh, these cells to uh, regenerate themselves. So it's a minimum of three weeks. Clinical signs, so what is this horse going to show? Fever, uh, high fever, okay? This horse gets really sick. He is listless, he's in the corner. He doesn't wanna eat, he doesn't wanna drink. Uh, that's why I say here anorexia. Anorexia, when used in veterinary terms, is not that the horse is looking at himself and thinking that he is uh, overweight. It's the complete zero desire for food, which is different from inappetence. Inappetence, a horse doesn't want to eat his hay. He's like, oh, I don't feel like. But if you give him a peppermint, he will be like, oh, okay, I will kind of eat the peppermint. But anorexia is he doesn't want the sight or smell of food. Uh, you're going to have nasal discharge, it starts as serous, so like liquidy and uh, transparent, and it can turn into mucopurulent, which muco means uh, more thick. Purulent means it's uh, mixed with pus, so it is uh, a sign of bacterial infection. It becomes yellow or green, that's mucopurulent. Serous is uh, just like the more fluidy and transparent. Cough, very severe cough. As a matter of fact, weight loss, this horse doesn't want to eat, it doesn't eat, and there's going to be weight loss that happens. Uh, a complication can be even colic because this horse is not eating or drinking, and clinical signs, the cough can last uh, two, three, four weeks. This horse continues to cough, okay? So it can take, like I said, a week of rest for fever. It can take multiple days for you if it's a severe case, for you to combat even the fever of this horse. And pneumonia, which comes from secondary bacterial infection, is a semi-common occurrence after influenza. How do we diagnose these horses? Uh, we have to uh, compare it with other diseases, differentiate with other respiratory diseases, which uh, the three most important respiratory diseases in horse are influenza, equine herpes virus one and four, and EVA. Uh, vir viral, okay, viral respiratory diseases. Obviously, strangles is a bacterial one. Uh, so you have to differentiate between them. So the one of the ways to do it is to try to isolate the virus. So you do a swab up the nose of the horse and try to do virus isolation. And it may take a day or two uh, to be able to do that. And you can try to do antibody detection of antibodies against influenza and see, you know, um, if it is indeed influenza, you, try, you test multiple horses. How do we treat these animals? Uh, to rest, okay, rest is the main thing in a non-stressful environment, uh, in a clean environment where air is fresh. One week of rest, I've already said that fluids, if this horse starts to become dehydrated, he may need to receive IV fluids. Uh, if he is drinking water, you need to do everything to incite him to continue to drink water. You're gonna give Benamine uh, for pain, but if anybody has had influenza, your whole body hurts. Uh, so benamine for pain and fever. And horses showing signs, even if, like after 10 days, you need to start probably giving antibiotics. Now, according to the, to the price tag on this horse, he's probably going to start with antibiotics on the second day. Okay, so if it's a very valuable horse, they are not, the veterinarians are not going to be taking any chances, okay? The return to athletic activity can be three months, okay? Uh, sometimes four, five, six months uh, after the disease has cleared. In humans, we uh, use uh, Tamiflu and other antivirals. All these antiviral drugs that we use in humans um, haven't been 
uh, successfully used in horses. And um, so it's no use for us. How do we prevent this disease? <clears throat> so vaccination, so horses that are going to be in training or show horses, horses that are going to be competing, going to trail rides or mixing with horses from different origins uh, need to be vaccinated. Okay, so like I said, influenza doesn't confer uh, a very strong immunity. Uh, and generally the vaccine is uh, a killed virus vaccine and that is going to give immunity for about four to six months, okay? So these animals need to be vaccinated. The animals that show all the time need to be vaccinated twice a year. Uh, and this is what I say here. So inactivated uh, vaccines is the kill vaccine. Uh, generally, we use very strong adjuvants for that. Adjuvant is the liquid, uh, the mix that is put with the vaccine. So to create an immune uh, response to there, to draw, uh, the white blood cells to the area of infect of injection, which is the neck. Uh, so you know it can lead uh, to very sore necks. Uh, there is modified live vaccines. That one uh, is an intranasal vaccine and gives uh, protection to maybe a little bit longer. Uh, and there is also a, a recombinant vaccine that possibly confers um, a little longer protection. How do we vaccinate? Mares need to be vaccinated two to six weeks prepartum. So they form uh, a lot of antibodies to pass through the colostrum. Um, so, you know, you need to make sure that the foal from a pregnant mare drinks the colostrum within two hours of life. Foals start receiving the vaccine, especially foals that will be, uh, be going to uh, go to training or foals that will one day uh, be living in a training facility or have contact with foals from other, uh, or horses from other origins, need to start receiving vaccination uh, after six months of age. And um, for this horse, they need to be vaccinated every six months. Um, now, horses that say live in a farm and never go anywhere, they're just pasture ornaments or really just live on a farm and have zero stress, probably don't need to be vaccinated for influenza, okay? because this is a, a disease that you need to be in contact with a sick horse to be able to get this disease. So that's why the AAP, the American Association of Equine Practitioners, has they divided their vaccination recommendations into two groups, the core vaccines and the risk-based vaccines. And the core vaccine is five diseases, tetanus, rabies, Eastern, Western encephalitis, and West Nile virus. Okay, so these five diseases are part of the core. Uh, the risk-based vaccine and, and, and the core vaccines need to be given to every horse gender, every use of the horse, because they are diseases that are severe to these horses. They can kill, and they also can sometimes pass to humans, and also, like in the case of rabies, and also uh, they're going to get because of the environment. <clears throat> such as mosquito bites. And then the risk-based vaccine is the group of vaccines where the veterinarian is going to define what the risk of this horse is, you know, is going to be uh, for this particular diseases. And then, like I said, influenza, if a horse, all he does is just stay at home and is just a pasture ornament, has no stress, doesn't meet new friends, and doesn't go to places, doesn't um, need to receive this vaccine. Obviously, management biosecurity is important. So when you get a new horse into a facility, you need to you know, quarantine this horse before introducing him to a new population, uh, quarantine this horse and temp him you know, twice a day to make sure that he is not spiking a fever before you introduce him so he doesn't spread the disease uh, to other horses. The other thing too is when you go to trail rides, horse shows, et cetera, there is no need for these horses to make friends, okay? So there is no need for this horse to touch nose, to share buckets, absolutely not, okay? So this is all good management practices to prevent the spread of disease, okay? Uh, like I said, it's difficult to isolate and quarantine performance horses because they come, they may come to this new facility just to spend two, three weeks there just to be tuned up. So how do you just quarantine this one uh, 
and not and just temp him several times. So it's very difficult on the way that we do horse businesses these days. Okay, so we depend on very heavy vaccination schedules and hopefully biosecurity measures of um, not touching nose, not sharing tech, not sharing buckets, etc. Okay, now. Like I said, different uh, facilities is going to become more difficult because if you have the same trainer, he doesn't wash his hands or he touches his horse here and there and just, or feeds the same, you know, touch a horse or, you know, so it's just difficult. So these animals that are going to be coming from different areas and places that are going to have different animals all the time need to uh, require vaccine. So like USCF requires uh, vaccination against flu and herpes virus every six months within within two weeks like or with I guess outside of two weeks prior to the event that the horse is going to be in so just uh, uh, racing places like a Kingland for example you also have to vaccinate these horses that are there you know for herpes and for uh, influenza so this is what I had to talk to you about influenza. Don't hesitate. If you have any questions, just uh, send me an email and we'll go from there. Bye.